I am going to do a barbecued fillet of salmon. Now I'm going to cure the salmon first. So whole salmon, let's fillet the whole salmon together. Kelly, I think you did one yesterday, didn't you? I tried, attempted. You tried, how did it go? Well, I managed to get one piece, so it was okay. One piece, it was okay. Uh, so first things first is, you know, you're going to go in up under the wing here somewhere, right up nice and close to the neck and just take across there. Hand on here and start at the nice top down this end and work my whole way around. You see the other thing I've done is I've put a cloth underneath, a nice dry cloth. Salmon's quite a slimy fish. Get rid of the oil off the outside and get rid of any moisture or water or anything like this because I don't want my fish going anywhere. The last thing you need is the fish moving around the board on you. That's a bit of a problem. I've got a nice big thick cloth underneath my board as well. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to push reasonably firmly on the fillet, not poke it but just a nice, reasonably firm, hard, fat hand. And what that does is this side of the fish down here, as soon as I push down, that side of the fish bulges out and it gives you a nice, good, plump area of where to cut down. Okay, so get nice and high up where the fillet is, right up on the shoulder, get your knife in. And also, guys, using this part of the knife. The worst part of the knife to use is the very tip. As soon as you start going in there like that, you're just gonna get nothing but jagged edges the whole way around. If you go with this nice long piece of the knife, you're just gonna work your way around, you're gonna get one clean slice. Get your knife in there, and you can pretty much follow it all the way down to the tail, okay? That's your first slice. Again, as soon as I press it, you can see that the whole fish just opens up. Don't need to stick my fingers in there and start digging around and, and messing it up. You're just pressing it like that, and that opens it up, and I can see exactly where I am inside there. I don't need to get involved in that at all. Nice firm on the fish, and I'm probably going to work at this cut. I've taken it to halfway. I can push my knife through, and I can go over the backbone. Now I'm going to work from the bottom, and then this top end, I'm going to go in, okay? So I'm basically in between the fillet and the backbone. Should be pretty much done. Now there's two ways of getting this side off. You can flip it over, and you can start doing the same thing and work it that way. I find the simpler way is to start on this side here. What I'm going to do is take my knife and go back through this way, just under the bones, okay? Then I'll turn it round and do the same thing up to the head, okay? The reason I like doing it this way is because it, you don't actually move the fish too much. I'm not bending it, I'm not changing the shape or anything like that. What it will do, it leaves a little bit more on the fish, but, you know, it's easier to get it off rather than having to bend it afterwards. So now under the fillet, and I'll take the tail off first. So I'm just working along the bone, which I've done, taking that part off. Then it's a matter of just holding the tail nice and working up to the head there. And then cut through. And then I'm going to start up on the top and start taking these, uh, these bones off down the side here. Nice, neat, lean, long, clean slices. Don't start giving it any of that hacking. That's a bit of a disaster. Nice and clean that way. Take that side of the fillet off. Spin the fish around. But again, I'm using pressure against the fish. And you're almost feeling, I can tell how, where the knife's going by what the pressure is against my fingers. And that's quite a big part of filleting the fish as well. Because you can tell what's going on, how close you are getting to your fingers by the movement underneath your fingers, rather than having to watch it the whole time. Okay, so just work it down. Pin bone in it, little tub of water, pin boners. Keep it nice and dry. Rub your hand along a little bit just to expose where all these pin bones are. And then, you know, usually use your thumb and your forefinger. And they just come straight off in the water like that. The line of bones follows down here, but then just off to the side then, run your fingers around, and I've just found one, two, three. There's not usually more than three, and they're not really long bones, they're just sort of half bones. Okay, so, curing. I've got demerara sugar. I've got really nice rock salt. I've got orange zest, a zest worth of two oranges in there, higher that all in, and we also have the lime zest. Now mix that together, now get in and rub it together. Bottom of the tray. You always need to layer top and bottom. I've left the skin on this cure. And then I'm gonna cover the top of the fish as well. 
Now what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to leave that to marinate for probably an hour and a half. I think an hour and a half for a whole side of salmon like that would be pretty good. So what I've done with my salmon is uh, left it for about an hour and a half curing, then I've just rinsed it off, completely rinsed it off, rinsed it off in the sink, just be careful handling it, and got all that salt and all that sugar and all that zest off the outside. Then I've taken it out and I've just trimmed it up to a really nice even piece. I've actually sort of taken the bottom half of the fish because I wanted that nice amount of belly on there. I quite like that belly actually because belly is one of the nicest parts of any fish really. It tends to have a little bit more fat in it. I've left the skin on because that's going to protect it. I'm going to rub it with a little bit of olive oil, a little bit more seasoning on the top, just salt. And then I'm actually going to bake it on a uh, cedar board. Now I've got an untreated piece of wood. You can use whatever wood you like, to tell you the truth. If you want to get a pine or manuka or whatever flavour, a nice flavour inside there. But on a barbecue, it's also a really nice way of protecting the fish. Uh, so that when you do put it in there, you know, it's not exposed. You don't have to worry about it sticking to the elements in there or anything like that. So let's put that straight in the barbie. Now I know this barbecue is nice and hot. I have soaked this piece of wood in water, okay? It's soaked in the water for about six hours, so hopefully it's had enough time uh, so that it's not gonna catch on fire in here and that it is uh, just going to allow the smoke to come through. It should get a nice amount of smoke from it. And then it also should bake the fish on top there as well. So I'll put that just down on the front. And then I'll close the lid and allow it to work sort of like an oven. So I'm thinking the salmon's probably going to take, uh, depending on the heat of the barbie, and I'm actually going to just, I'm really going to, this is, I'm playing this one totally by ear, okay? Um, so I'm going to start on the bottom, I may move it to the top, I may do it open, I may do it closed. We're going to do whatever it takes to cook it perfectly. Now let's start with our salad. We've got some really nice little baby cos leaves we're going to mix through here. We've got some beautiful spring onions. Now what I'm going to do with those is slice them through the salad. Okay, so um, let's have a look. You can see that the wood's starting to burn on one end. I'm getting a nice amount of smoke in it. I've already started to get color around the salmon on the outside, and it's already started to you know, cook reasonably quick. So what I'm gonna do is just put it straight up on the top there, and the temperature and the heat that's trapped underneath the hood is enough to just keep it cooking away now that I've initially got it started. So let's go through the salad. Some really nice thinly sliced spring onion. A little bit of rub in the hands just to mix it all up so you break up all those little individual pieces in there. Now I'm going to peel my cucumber and I'm going to do it in nice little battens. So I'm looking at battens about that sort of length. Okay, so first one off that, second one off that side. I'm working off the firm side of the, uh, of the cucumber there. You can see that I've got a nice stable side to base. As soon as I've done those two pieces, I can turn it onto this side and start working off the flat side, okay? Spin it around again, spin it around this side, last side, the seeds I'm not going to use. Okay, now this is a great salad that I've done with all sorts of seafood. I've done it with prawns, prawn and miso salad. Uh, it works well with certain meats as well. Uh, it's a beautiful dressing and a really, really nice, easy dish to make. In the salad, I'm also going to put some black sesame seeds for a lovely colour. I've got some cress and I've got some micro watercress as well, which is basically baby watercress. And last thing is edamame beans. So I really, really love the edamame beans. So just work your way through and pop as many as you can. And you want a lot. You want loads and loads and loads and loads. As many as you, probably this whole bowl I'd put in there. So for the dressing, I'm gonna start with our miso paste. Start with a little bit of the uh, rice wine vinegar in there. And just start slowly. Okay, we add a little bit of soy sauce. Just a touch, not a lot of soy sauce in this recipe. Tiny bit of sesame oil. And also actually just a little bit of water, just normal water. And now we're gonna start adding a, a pretty basic oil to actually, so a veg oil or something like that, and uh, keep whisking all the way through. Just whisk that all together. That's it, pretty much done. Let's give this piece of salmon one nice final proper blast right in the center. See what that does to it. 
I started at the front of the barbecue before. This time I'm gone towards the back where it's a, there's a lot more heat. Smack bang in the middle. Close it up and hopefully I'll get a really nice amount of heat off that to finish it off. Let's dress the salad. Oh! So yes, it has caught on fire. <laughs> um, I don't have a problem with that. It's not panic stations. You know, it's not the end of the world, as I say. It is, um, you know, at the end of the day, you can see what's happened. We've caught the whole end of the board on fire. Salmon is still just under. I would say. Uh, you got a lot, nice amount of smoke from it. Um, embarrassed? No, no. I think it looks good. Uh, it's nice and hot right around the outside. I've got a really nice char on this end, as you can see, blackened, uh, which is sort of the look I wanted, actually, because you want to pull the piece of board out there um, and have it on the board rather than on the fish. Do you not agree? Kelly, what do you think? Salesman. <laughs> total salesman. But it's true, isn't it? If it was a total disaster and it had blown up in flames and had charcoal all over it and it was completely black, um, I'd be stuffed. I would be stuffed. Um, you know, we caught it in time, you pull it out, put a tea towel over it, uh, smolder the flames, and, you know, let's taste it and see how we go. But I assume it's still going to be fantastic. So, salad on the side. Uh, I've got my nice mixed salad here. Mix it all the way through and generally most of those ingredients will sit on the bottom. Make sure you get all those out and get those really nice ingredients sitting on top. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, we have our cured salmon that's been cured in brown sugar, orange, lime, salt. We've gone a bit heavy on the baking. We've got a bit of a char around the outside here. Most important thing, the salmon is perfectly cooked and beautifully intact. We've got a really nice salad on the side. Miso dressing, done. Hi everybody. What is it about this barbecue that has this mystique that we all kind of like? It's got open flames. It's got flames, yeah. It's like cooking over fire. There's some sort of weird primeval urge inside all of us <laughs> together with the tribe, you know, and cut up the game and cook it outside. You know, it, it's special. And the thing about the barbecue is it tastes different. You know, it's got that really lovely smoky flavour that you don't get by standing in front of a frying pan. So that's why we like it. Otherwise, you go inside and use the stove, you know? Sausages. These are, are a pork sausage. I'm going to cook them on the flat grill plate because quite a lot of fat's going to come out of these, and I don't want it to go through there and make lots of flames, because if I get lots of flames, it's going to burn the food. It's going to make soot, which is black and taste bitter. So forget all about that flame grilled nonsense. You don't grill over flames. You grill over embers. This is low because the secret of cooking these sausages, they're a little thing and enclosed in a skin full of, and there's a bit of air in there. When it gets hot, what happens? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. If you cook it too hot, too fast, it's gonna burst. <laughs> I'm just gonna put a tiny little bit of olive oil on here. Not too much. We'll just make a small hole in these so that um, any air that's inside there can escape slowly. These are gonna go on here. And this thing I'm making is grilled sausages with grilled vegetables and salsa cruda. I'm getting this on here first, and I'm getting it brown. Does anyone know why I'm getting it brown like this? For flavor? Flavor, yeah, definitely for the flavor. Some people that have, uh, think that if you are gonna cook meat or you know, pan fry or grill or barbecue meat, you've got to get it really hot to seal in the moisture. It's a load of rubbish. Okay, complete load of rubbish. You cannot seal moisture inside meat with high heat. You do it to make it look good and taste good. I'm gonna really let these take their time and I'm gonna get these vegetables ready to go with them. I've got some rather good looking capsicums here. And the thing about that I like about grilled vegetables is you've got this lovely smoky heat driving off all the water out of these vegetables and leaving all the residual sugars and the flavors of the vegetables which make them taste more intense and really, really delicious. Anybody want to come and help me? Nadia, yeah. you up here? Right, grab yourself a knife. I want the, the other one like that and the red one's like that as well. Yep, thanks, Good. Mary. The only other thing that we're going to put in there is some courgettes or zucchini. 
So all I want to do is just slice these thinly. It'd have to be the most well-behaved class I've ever had. You don't <laughs> say anything. You only ask some questions. Uh, lots of people like to, um, you know, chuck a lot of oil on the hot plate. I noticed you oiled the sausages yeah. first before throwing them on. Was there a reason for that? Um, well, from a practical point of view, if you start pouring oil over this, you can set fire to it for a start, and also you end up with a very dirty barbecue. I always oil the food, not the um, barbecue. Nadia, are we in business here? Right, watch out for those little pips, we don't want those. <laughs> Throw that in there, bit of that on there, not too much. Bit of pepper and salt. You don't need to season sausages. You, you know, good butcher will have seasoned that for you. you now just give those a turnover. These are looking a little bit toasty, aren't they? So far, so good, nothing's burst. And then these, you can do it with your fingers, it's much quicker. Mm -hmm. Just line those up along there like that. And they're gonna be cooked when they sort of collapse a little bit and when they're nice and browned. Now, Nadia, when mm -hmm. you've done that, not yep. that, you know, I know you've got a bit on your dinner plate right now, but your next job right. is do the same thing with those yep. while I make this sauce. Salsa cruda, it's a great thing to know. It's basically like a vinaigrette with other stuff chopped up and thrown into it. It, it goes through spaghetti, it goes on bruschetta, it goes on just about anything barbecued. It, I really like it. It's vinegar, oil, and things like tomatoes and that, which is what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna start off with a very small clove of garlic. Now, yeah, this is a really good sauce to make very early on in the day because the salt on those tomatoes, which are right here, is gonna draw the juices out of the tomatoes. Gives the sauce a really good flavor. Okay, we are, we're in business here. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, immediately I'm anxious, okay? Because for me, I like to see all the courgettes lined up. Oh. You know, call me compulsive, but <laughs> this is what you do when you're in a kitchen. Not only are you counting to yourself all the mm. time, but you're organizing all the time, okay? So let's put these where they're gonna cook. You've gotta know exactly, exactly where it all is, yeah. which is sort of that French thing, mise en place, you know? Everything's put in its place, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, I even to the point, Nadi, where I like them all up the same way. I mean, you know, I should get out more, you know, really. Okay, calm down, Nadi. We're getting hysterical here, you know? All right, back to the sauce. So, I want to use all those pips, all that juice. Are those done? Are they done? Do you think that's That's looking one? very good. When okay. they're done, yep. you can pop them on there yep. in separate piles. Right. Chopped tomatoes go in there. And I want about 75 mils of extra virgin olive oil and a couple of tablespoons of capers. So I'm putting sort of sour, salty things in here. The charm of this sauce is you get these little explosions of taste all the time. Little explosions of taste that go together. Now, Nadia, mm -hmm. did you burn my vegetables? That side was hotter than that side. Oh, okay, blame the, blame the barbecue. <laughs> These ones right, right, other people's kitchens. Don't you hate other people's kitchens? Yeah, okay. They're always different from your own ones. Yeah. And you guys, I mean, <laughs> you're in another person's kitchen quite a lot of the time. Yeah. All right, let's have those sausages, which I would think are now ready on there. I'll finish this sauce. The only other thing I want in here is these beautiful Kalamata olives. They've been pipped or pitted. I want to season it with some pepper. I've got olives and capers in here, so I don't really want to throw a whole lot of salt in there until I've tasted it. I'll give that a taste. In fact, I won't give that a taste until I've put some of this beautiful Saporosa balsamic in it. Give it a stir up, have a taste. Tastes pretty good to me. Nadia, what do you think? All right. That balsamic is Yeah, really I imagine nice. that through hot it's really, spaghetti. It is really sweet. Yeah, yeah, it's quite sweet. Not one of those really sharp, sharp ones yeah, that, mm. you know, take your breath away. You don't want one of those. Okay, I'm ready to put this thing together. A bit of this. See all that nice roasty, toasty looking barbecue action that's been going on there. Sausage here, which I'm just gonna slice a bit like that. Spoon some of this on top. And the final thing, which is not a garnish, is some basil, which this is hot. 
This is gonna make this basil smell really beautiful and adds to the flavor. So, barbecued pork sausages with char-grilled vegetables and salsa cruda. Now, Simon's gonna be along in a minute with a fantastic tuna dish, but in the meantime, who'd like to taste this? Nadia, Tracy Lee, yep. up you come. Do I get the stare down? Um, I'm not that bad, I'm not as bad as Jax. <laughs> All right. That's fantastic. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the humble New Zealand sausage on the barbecue. Hi, guys. Welcome to Elephant Hill Winery, the most state-of-the-art winery you'll ever visit. It's five years old, and everything in this winery is the best money can buy. And that should inspire you to create some stunning dishes. It's a beautiful day, we're really blessed. I mean, it couldn't be better. It's just an amazing place to be. But if you're looking for the kitchen, there's a twist. Today, you'll be cooking al fresco on barbecues. I was shocked to hear that it was on the barbecue. That straight away made me think, okay, I can't do this, I'll have to do something else. The barbecues that we've provided are the best that money can buy you. There is nothing these barbecues can't do, so you should have no problems. But let's not forget, you're cooking with lamb, so you'll need to watch your cooking times. A secret to cooking lamb is not having it underdone and not having it overdone. You have to get it just right. You've got 60 minutes to cook your signature Hawke's Bay lamb dish, and your time starts now. Hi right, Dave, how are you? Uh, yep, pressure's on. Uh, time's going so quick today. What are you cooking? I'm cooking a, a beautiful lamb fillet um, with asparagus and baby carrots, yep. everything fresh. Yep, how's the meat look? Pretty good, just needs a bit of a trim. This is, this is it, I've got to show you guys what I can do. So. Fantastic, good luck mate. Thank well you, I appreciate that. This dish is going to be outstanding. I haven't had an individual win since the golden apron at the very start. I'd love to be able to absolutely nail this one. Countdown has commenced, the pressure is intense. It was really, really fast today. We had to just do everything quickly. There was no stopping, there was no contemplating, nothing. Marinating my lamb, and it's gonna have a crust over the top. I'm gonna to do a fennel and kumara rosti. And there is um, North African spices, which is cumin, coriander, a little bit of fennel. I was quite comfortable today. I didn't really feel that nervous. It was good, it was a nice feeling, actually. When Ray said it was a barbecue challenge, I had to rethink a few things and rethink how I'm going to prepare things because it caught me a little bit by surprise. I've never, never cooked lamb ever before on a barbecue. I've only got one piece of the loin, so I hope I don't stuff up. Just trying to get rid of all the sinewy, fatty bits because once they're cooked, they will come up hard and yucky and not edible. This looks interesting. What is it? So I've got some herbs in there. Pop it onto the blender, blend it up to make it into a cross for my backstrap that I've got. I've got some mustard, which I'm going to put with my baby carrots, which I've popped here. And I've got some chili pickle pears, which I've got there as well, which I'm going to pop into my apple and fennel salad. And as well as that, I've got some beautiful um, mouldy potatoes here. God, they've certainly got some dirt on those, oh, haven't right. they? They'll be easy to clean. Yeah, well, as we say, we've got a stunning day, mate. I want to see sure. some stunning lamb dishes, so go for it's gold, easy. mate. Thank you, Josh. All right. Beautiful Hawke's Bay weather. It couldn't be better. These guys have got the best barbecues in the world to cook with. They've been shopping and bought their own produce from the market. I reckon we're in for one hell of a tasting today. I think this could be the tasting that we've been waiting for. I'm expecting nine spectacular dishes. I wouldn't have a clue who's going home today. The thing about this is that they've got amazing products. Don't do too much to them. Yeah. Just, you know, uh, work with them gently and just accentuate their sort of natural flavours um, and look after them, and I think they're on to a winner. I think Tony's keeping it simple. He's doing a rosemary crust on his lamb, but setting it on quite an interesting potato dish. Potato and Granny Smith gratin with cumin gouda cheese. That could be quite interesting. I'm looking forward to trying that. I can't overcook it today. If anything, you want it to be a little bit under. It's just beautifully fresh. There's no way I'm going to overcook this, otherwise I'll be going home. 
So just a nice little wee rosemary salt. I'm making a special salt to season the lamb. I had a big stick of rosemary, but I thought, no, I don't want to serve it a beautiful bit of meat with like crusty bits of herb that have kind of burnt from the barbecue. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cook my meat and I'm going to turn it really quickly and I'm going to use the rosemary as a brush and I'm going to just like baste it with olive oil. That way I could transfer the rosemary to that. So I knew that the smokiness of the ch is genius. Barbecuing is genius. Smoking me out, Dave. Sorry, bro. <coughs> it's almost there. Uh, once the juices start coming through, you know, I'll probably take that off and just let it rest. Ten minutes to go, everybody. I know that it tastes all good, the flavours are all there for me. I'm really happy with the way that the coke came out. It tastes great, it's sitting in place well, it cuts perfectly. And it is delicious. Which one to use? I know, that's the thing. This one's cracked a little bit in the crust. And the other one's sweet, so I've just got to make sure that I can crack through it without breaking it and making it look ugly. Three minutes left. Too red and burn it. I'm out of time. I have to plate up. The mushrooms are fine. I've got the parsnip chips. They're all organised. The reduction's been reducing away nicely. It's in the pan. It's been served. But the key thing is this lamb. OK, here we go. I cut it straight down the middle. Bugger. It's too rare. Come on, Tony. Thinking now. You've got three minutes left. Sort it out. And it's going to be a little bit tricky to do this. If it's raw, everything else on the plate doesn't matter. It's the key ingredient. Oh, this is just going to create a big fire. No, I'm not doing it. I'd rather serve it too red than burn it. OK, how can I cut this? Oh, That's not looking very good for me. I think it needs to cook a little bit more, but I don't have time. I have to think very fast. I have to cook it for as long as I could. Ten seconds left. Got shakes. Nine, eight, <laughs> seven, six. I remember five, I've got my reduction. Four, it's quite dramatic, yeah. Three, two, one. Step away from the bench. It's over. I stand back and I look at my plate and realise that it kind of looks like a bit of a bomb's gone off on it. <sighs> Holy <sighs> bro, that's hectic. That was the fastest hour of my life, I think. I'm very happy with the way my lambs come out. I cut a bit off myself and it's incredible. I was nervous going into the tasting. What's going to happen here? Am I on the chopping block or have I done well? It's the lamb eye fillet, honey caramelised carrots, char grilled asparagus. And what's the sauce? It's a natural yoghurt and honey from the region. A return to form, eh? You seem to be justifying your golden apron these days. You've used the barbecue to get that lovely smoky flavour. But the thing that goes so beautifully with the smokiness is the honey in the carrots and the honey in the yoghurt. I think you've got a plate full of winning flavours. Well done. Thank you, Ray. Ray, Josh and Simon, they all loved it. And I was just so happy. It's... It's incredible. I, you know, it's smoked food's part of my, I guess, uh, my thing. So what I usually do is we, we make what we call little smoke envelopes, which means it's nice and clean, it's easy to use. So what we've got is we've got a little manuka chips in here. I put some slits in there. And then what we can do is we put the rack on and then you can tin for the top so it's like, like a chamber. And so what I've done is here, we've got two tomatoes, like just, just half tomatoes, put on the rack, and then I, I've actually pasted some tomato paste on it with a, just a dash of brown sugar. And then you probably just smoke it on a medium to high heat for maybe 12 minutes, 14 minutes, and then you turn the heat off and then just let the smoke settle. Because if you lift a lid off, with fish in it, it's fine because you want it maybe a degree of moisture and stuff. But with, with, the, with things like vegetables, you want the smoke to settle and go cold. So you actually get that smoke flavour through it because you've got to remember there's a lot of moisture in vegetables. So you want that smoky flavour through. So let that go cold and then you end up with that. You know, you've got that smoked tomato and some smoked tomato paste. These are beefsteak tomatoes, these ones. So just pop that in a pot. In here we've got some raspberry vinegar or red wine vinegar or balsamic vinegar, whatever you may choose. Some olive oil, you don't use, need to use the really good quality stuff, just a nice pure olive oil or pomachi oil. We've got some red onion, some garlic some basil, some Italian parsley, and I'm going to pop that in there. 
and then you just put that onto the element, then let that cook out for about 15 minutes. So that, that's our smoked tomato compote, nice and easy. And then what we've got next is we're going to put the rib on. And to me, I don't marinate it up. I, I mean, to me, you know, we've got such good quality beef in New Zealand, I let the product do the talking, you know. So just oil it a bit, season it up. So we just pop it on, just test it. We'll put that puppy on there. And what I've done is I've wrapped the bone so it doesn't burn and so at the end we can just take the bone. And what we're going to do is that we're going to actually slice it like a roast. So you're not going to stand there like, you know, Freddie Flintstone and be able to eat it and, and stuff. But I think it's nice. It's, it's a beautiful piece of meat. It's got nice marbling. So you got to remember it's the ribeye and it's got that nice bit of fat in there. So it's quite user friendly. So if somebody can let me know when five minutes is up, we're going to turn that puppy over. So we've got our, our, our meat working there. Asparagus, seasonal asparagus. Medium sized, small asparagus, I don't bother peeling. To me, it's fine, it's tender. Whereas if you've got the bigger asparagus, it pays to peel it. So what we'll do is we'll oil that up a little. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna char grill this. We're going to, this is lard on bacon. Um, at the restaurant, we make our own bacon. So it's belly bacon and it's with like a pickling brine. It's like a ham brine. And we brine pork belly and then we uh, marinate it for two days and then it's cured and so then we smoke it and then we roast it. Rex, five minutes. Oh, yeah. So uh, the lardon bacon, lardons are just small battens and what I've done is I've kept it whole so we can actually grill it and then we'll cut it at the end because um, sometimes you get these little lardons, they're all a little separate and then when you cook them, it's quite harsh around the edge. So I actually like to cook it, keep it moist and then cut it up so you've still got soft pieces around the edge. So with that beef, I've, I'm, I'm going to turn it again. Some people have a thing about only turning steaks once and all this blah, blah. I mean, to me, it doesn't really matter, you know. The thing is, you've got to watch it, you've got to control it. Um, it's about caramelization. You don't want too much caramelization on one side, not the other. Uh, you don't want too much caramelization, otherwise it's going to taste really leathery and burnt. But you do want a bit of caramelization because it's flavor. The lardons, they're hard to overcook, so pretty easy. Mushrooms, really simple, good old New Zealand mushrooms. What I've got here is a little bit of raspberry vinegar, some fresh marjoram and some olive oil. And I'm just going to marinate that up. And usually you sort of leave it overnight in one of those like little resealable bags or even for at least a couple of hours anyway. And um, I've got raspberry vinegar or sherry vinegar in that. It's just a nice change from balsamic. It's not so heavy and I have pre-marinated some. So what you're going to get is that that nice, soft, it's taken on the flavor. And we're gonna dab that dry. So we'll take these lardons off, just rest it. Well, just sit them over here to keep. Anyone, we've got some time on this puppy? On the meat? You've just done your four minutes. Oh, perfect. See, I know. <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll take that off to rest. Today I'm going to do an OP rib, it's called. It's an individual uh, beef rib. I'm going to be doing some saffron marinated prawns. And then here we've got pre-cooked agria potatoes, just sliced, boiled, or you can boil the whole potato. And it is what it is, you know, it's pretty simple. We'll oil those slightly. And then we're just gonna grill those on the solid top. We'll start getting all these on. So it's pretty much finishing up time now. And so we're gonna get all this going on. I'm gonna put the potatoes on the solid top. And the reason why I like to put the potatoes on the solid top, I can always add more oil to it. Asparagus is next. So we're going to line it from top to bottom and all working out well. We're going to do the money shot and roll it down. These, sometimes it pays just to have a little dab dry because you don't want all that moisture going through. Everything's on the go. Then we're going to do some uh, prawns, take the heads off and we split them. A little bit of saffron, and New Zealand's got some of the best saffron in the world, so we're using a bit of that from down south. And a little oil and a little water, and just, just let, let the flavour go through. So I'm just going to add a little oil to the potatoes there. Going to pop those over. We're going to roll the asparagus, bring it down, just so you get these nice char marks on the outside. Remember, asparagus is really delicate, so you don't want to be too aggressive with the char marks. So you just want to cook it through a little... 
Mushrooms will turn around a couple of times. Prawns will turn over. The prawns are really simple. I mean, it's just pretty much the tail and you cut the inside out, take the, the what we call the poo shoot out, and then uh, just marinate it up really easy. I mean, you can just split them in half. It's really up to you. So we'll just put the prawns on the resting rack. So asparagus is pretty much done. I'm gonna rest it up on top just to hold it warm. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the beef, beef back on. Someone can give me say a minute, two minutes. I like medium rare beef, so that's, but it's really, it's, it's really how you want it, you know? It's really a personal thing. Obviously if it's another degree, say medium, you're gonna add another two minutes to each side, I reckon. And that's around about a 500 gram piece. So we'll flash the lardons. And so what I've got over here is the finished product of the sauce. So what I've done is I've, you can put in a Morton pestle, uh, just a stick blender. I mean, sometimes in the middle of nowhere you haven't got a stick blender. A masher, the back of a spoon, whatever you want. It's really how you want. And it's something that can be served at room temp. I mean, ideally you can actually just pre-make that and take it wherever you want to go. I mean, I've probably got a litre of it in my fridge all the time, so you know. So that's our finished product. I'm gonna put the potatoes into here. But what I like is I like to actually Because of the heat of the potatoes, this is truffle oil, what I like to do is let the heat of the potatoes suck that truffle oil in, you know, so you're not wasting truffle, and truffle oil is not cheap, you know. So, toss them around like that, so you can see that nice color, shiny, little bit of seasoning, and that's done. We'll just sit the mushrooms up the top here. It's like a little buffet going on. So we've got the lard on there we're going to cut up. So you see what I mean about it's nice and soft, whereas if, if you're just frying pieces like that, they get quite harsh. You know, you, you lose the effect of the pork. I'm going to put the asparagus in here. You can put it in a long plate. It's really up to you. And it's that thing again of, I like adding things while they're warm. So what I'm going to put in here is in vin cotto. You could use balsamic, raspberry, we're going to share, we're going to all those things. But I'm actually going to use vin cotto. What vin cotto is, it's actually grape must. So it's, it's pressed grapes, they're heated really, grape juice, it's heated really slowly and it just becomes a nice, it's like, it's like a really smooth balsamic, you know? So that's been cotto. A little bit of olive oil. Dash of seasoning. You see while I'm doing that, we'll just do the opie rib a little. And then our lardons. And then toss those around. Nice and easy. Right, I guess it's time to plate up this puppy. Our mushrooms. Our asparagus. And to me, this food's great to have, like, when you've got groups of friends, you just chuck it all on a plate and chuck it in the middle of the table, you know? You're not individually got your own little fillet and all this stuff. And our prawns. Our potatoes. Chuck a bit of this tomato sauce on. Not that I do this at home all the time, but we'll do one of those trendy little skid I mean smudges. <laughs> Here you go. There's this pooper shooter. <laughs> it's not essential to have the nice clean bone, but you know, it's always nice. To me, it's always nice to eat something that looks as though someone's a kid. So whether it's a barbie, whether it's a pie, whatever it is, I mean. All right. So there, you know, nice, medium, rare. Hopefully it's not running, you can't see the juices running out. You know, there used to be the old myth, my, you know, my dad was a classic, you know, he said it has to be a juicy steak, the juice is running out, but once you learn how to cook, you know, it's not always about the juices running out. Juicy can still be juicy without juices running out. See, look at that. Nice little piece at the end. And that's it. Very simple. Mm,